so basically the success story can be someone outside but also the person involved that they they are the success story and i i think we use that quite often when we for example measure physical activity before yeah. and after they see the success and i think for that it's important that we actually can measure really accurately that they will actually see the change because if they if they change something and we cannot measure it like for some reason that's that's a yeah and i think even with that like measuring physical activity like the what data are you giving as feedback because sometimes it can be too much information and then other times it can be presented poorly or it can not be enough information and so some of that is also going to factor into whether or not it will be framed as a success so i think objectively someone can succeed and improve or achieve their goal but they might not perceive that as a success and i think that's almost more important than the objective outcome um yeah yeah I, I think that's a good point because yeah anyway if you measure many things you can find that something's improved and and then labeling as a success i think it's a good starting point and i had a episode with peter katzmarchaik who is a, a obesity researcher and he said that the early success in an intervention is super important that yeah. in the first month you need to succeed and then yeah. everything gets easier. But if you fail in the beginning to make changes, then then it gets really, really difficult. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I think like I the phrase I've heard is accumulate small wins. And I apply that to everything. Um, particularly if people are sitting who are gonna do a PhD and things, you need to accumulate small wins. You can't just keep thinking about this massive lofty goal of a thesis. Um, you need to think about what's the goal for today that is achievable. Um, otherwise, it, it can be an overwhelming time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I fully agree. And if, if I go back to this story and with the children, we at the at Phibian, I'm working at, at, in addition to being a podcast, also in a company which is making activity tracking devices for professionals. And we are working on this kind of concepts that when children are doing the measurement, they actually get the feedback in form of a polar bear animation. So basically the polar bear is telling them results and then how these things affect. But we are trying to talk the language of the children, but I think yeah. we don't have at the moment a good story there. We don't actually have a success story as I'm now, now thinking of it. What would be your advice to make make the polar bear and children's physical activity work? Oh, like, uh, I don't know, the two crazy ideas that come to mind are inside the polar bear, it's a polar bear suit and there's a kid inside the suit and, and you find that out or something like that. Um, so that then it's relatable and it's like, I am the polar bear. Um, mm -hmm. Or when you, if it's a, is it a product, like a physical device that they it, get? It is, yeah. Yeah, they could have like a, a puppet of the polar bear that comes with it or something like that. So that then it's like, I I love this polar bear and I want to receive the rewards of the polar bear or whatever. I don't really know how it works, obviously, but um, I think there needs to be a real like, uh, like a friendship, kind of not friendship, but a, 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 like a, um, salience to want to please and impress the bear. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Or relate yeah. to the bear. Yeah. yeah um, so I, if it, the thing, if it is, a, if it was a kid instead of a polar bear, I think that could be boring. But like, if it was something funny where it's like, oh, actually there's a kid dressed up as a polar bear or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's very relatable. Like I just think about my kids running around in costumes all the time. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, th I think that's a nice idea. And we try to make, we, we are now now producing like polar bear stickers that when they do the measurement, yeah. they can choose different color and different polar bear in a different position. And, and we will we will test how how those will work and, and try different things. But I think we need to make the animation a little bit more story. Now we kind of have it's come from the results that all right there's a results of sitting time and then we tell this tell the results and tell like a little bit of health effects or encouragement to move or something but i think we don't have an overarching story in it and and we, yeah. we need to develop that yeah and i think yeah it's similar like so i read a, a blog or something um recently it might have been an article about um gamifying rewards and things like that and it was talking about 
do we do that? Um, is it is it to try and like <laughs> sneakily teach them something or whatever, or are we doing it because like it genuinely will be really really fun and engaging? And I think like there's that real combination. You need people to really just want to do that, <laughs> um, but at the same time you want it to achieve some sort of like helpful goal rather than it being addictive for the sake of being addictive sake. Um, yeah, mm. it's a tricky, I, I think it's a really tricky thing to work out. Um, but yeah, I definitely recommend checking out um, Dan Ariely's um, behavioral economics stuff. Like he, so like an example he gave, he does lots of stuff with actual money, but there is also lots of health and psychology things. Um, and it was like, there's a journal selling a subscription um, and it costs, I don't know, I'll just make up the numbers, $100 for a 12-month subscription. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the way that they phrase it, so you read it, it's like the Journal of Economics, um, $100 per month. Um, and then directly under that, the next button down is $100 per year. And so the, the reader thinks that that must be an error <laughs> um, and this is a bargain. I am definitely buying the 12 months. And, and it's because... If there was only the hundred dollars for twelve months, you you don't have any like anchor to know whether or not that's good. So like, if the polar bear is giving out a red sticker, I don't know. Like, is that good? I, I don't know. Red is red sometimes is scary, but red is maybe cool. Or and and, and so there's no anchor for this hundred dollars for twelve months. But when you suddenly also put a comparison value um, that's twelve times worse. Then suddenly mm. it's like, oh wow, this is um, this is a really good deal, and I should I should act upon it now, and and so the equivalent I've been thinking about this with one of my colleagues at work um, in terms of physio lecturing is if you gave someone an exercise program and said um, like if they really loved gold stars or the polar bear, let's use polar bear stickers. If they really love polar bear stickers, and you said, okay, if you do um, one thousand steps a day, you will get a sticker. And if you do a hundred thousand steps a day, you're going to get a sticker, and 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 like for them, they'll be like, "Great, I'll do a thousand steps a day." But if they were previously only doing ten steps a day or something, then to go to a thousand is a bit like. So you could obviously change the numbers. Make it mm -hmm. if you were aiming for ten thousand steps a day, you could do ten thousand and and fifty thousand or something ridiculous. And then you go, "Wow, like I still get the sticker even if I only do ten thousand. And suddenly that the reference point is 50,000 rather than the reference point being, mm -hmm. oh, fit people do 10,000 steps. So you can really change where people are anchoring their success to. Um, and so like if you could have a character go ahead of the kid and get the sticker and be really happy, like they go and show their teacher and their mum and dad and blah, 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 and then the, then the game starts, it's like, the kid is going to want the sticker. <laughs> um, like if they've seen the example is whatever, Zoe Zoppin's got a, got a sticker. I want a sticker. <laughs> um, whereas if it's just like, oh, you get a, you get a red sticker for doing something. What does that mean? And um, so yeah, you kind of need to establish that the pretend reward is a real reward. <laughs> um, but I guess a sticker is pretty cool at the same time. I ha <laughs> Yeah. One of my daughters loves stickers for toilet training and the other one, she wanted to blow a whistle. And so we did. <laughs> <laughs> different behavioral strategies <laughs> yeah yeah of, of sure. course you need need those yeah th those are those are really really good points and and also in this one we need to think that there's there's children and then there's parents and basically we need to kind of educate or influence both that the children would would actually get get more active do you have any any ideas how how should we approach the parents in this kind of thing they will also mm. see the results of the measurement yeah i feel comfortable answering this in terms of pain to start with um yeah, yeah. And so when we when we interviewed kids about how they think about pain um one of the classic examples that sticks out i think it was a nine-year-old girl and she said whenever you get pain you just need to have a knee replacement and I, like, I was doing the interviews and I went, I was like, excuse, sorry, what do you mean? And she's like, oh, well, my mum had pain and she got a knee replacement and it was all better. And then my neighbor had pain and she got a knee replacement. And I, I said, but like, almost jokingly, I, in my head, I was thinking, like, what's she going to say for other types of pain? I said, like, what about a headache? She's like, yeah, knee replacements fix pain. And so because, because ki like until the age of 12, a child doesn't really have the ability to think abstractly and it's around eight, 12 when they can start doing that. And so the idea is, well, 
like it's like if pain then knee replacement <laughs> and there is no negotiating on that at all um and she had an, an n of two a story of two examples of that um and i just remember like she was so clear in that and and i guess what we learned from that study is how influential these people around a child are and particularly siblings and parents and whoever's at home with the kids really um And I think if we, like often what we see in adult pain clinics is you teach someone about the science of pain, they they start getting better and then you don't see them for a while and then they come back and they're not not doing as great. And then you find out, oh yeah, my my husband actually, he still ties up my shoes and and he doesn't want me to bend anymore. He's told me that my discs might pop out, blah, blah, blah. Like all these really unhelpful beliefs. And it's because conceptual change and behavior change happened within the patient but not within the social surrounds. And because pain is biopsychosocial, we really need a whole revolution, like a conceptual revolution is the term that we're aiming for. Um, And so for kids, it's really, really clear cut. I think we need the child to change their understanding. We need the child to change their behavior. But more than that, we need the parent to be completely on board with that. And um, and any pediatric clinician who's here listening, I'm sure knows the importance of having the buy-in of the family. Um, but I think doing that in an educational setting is harder. Like, and particularly when it's like, I'm constantly thinking about kids books at the moment. It's like, I'm just handing this over. How are we going to have control and how can we validate their concerns and how can we get buy-in from the parents as well? And so we're building the online platform and it's going to be hopefully a two-way conversation and, and things like that. So um, yeah, I like to go back to your question of how important are parents, I just think it's absolutely critical that the whole household kind of changes the way that they're um, thinking and behaving. Otherwise, like it'd be the same in dieting, physical activity, pain, like lots of different areas. If if everyone's not on board, then it creates tensions and then that becomes the, the thing that divides relationships. And yeah, I don't know. I just think it's much better if we can... Um, give really high quality education <laughs> mm, yeah yeah that that's actually interesting that with the pain things you have been paid paying attention to it because pain is quite quite individual thing but even then yeah. the the family and other people around are are really important so how do you do, do this buy-in of family how how do you promote how do you facilitate that they they also understand the concepts and and the important things yeah and i i like i mean um one of the educational theories that's really popular for me teaching in a, in a university setting is called constructivism and and the idea is that the learner is an active participant and they're constructing knowledge and they're they're building upon their own prior understanding or maybe they're getting rid of their prior understanding and they're building new knowledge and understanding um it's not so much like a didactic, I'm receiving the learning, it's I'm actually doing the learning and I'm engaging in that. And and like, I guess, yeah, working in a pediatric setting, it, it, it just kind of happens all the time. Like you're always sitting alongside the kid and and you're trying getting, getting down to their eye level. And then the parent sees that example and, and tries to join in and, and then you encourage them. And so you create a dynamic where like you become less, um, they rely less on you. So you, you teach the parent, you teach the child, and then you try and let them go with it and see how they go. And then you might provide some feedback. Um, and I think it's it's going to be different for every single family because that dynamic is going to be um, different all the time. Like I don't think, I, I can't think of any friends I, I know who, who would have the exact same beliefs about how often they should sit in a day. Um, there'd be mm. some people who need to have thousands of dollars of chairs <laughs> and then there'd be other people who are happy to sit on the grass and and doesn't matter. Um, yeah, like I think that's such a broad spectrum. And then so then their family influences would be enormous as well. Um, so I'd say it depends on age. It depends on the parenting and how involved they are. Um, it also depends on the other people at home, like siblings and grandparents and friends and co- like particularly for athletes, we're finding... Um, people like soccer coaches or th- whoever that coach is that they're seeing frequently um, has such a big influence on their their beliefs about their body. Um, and so for, for pain, a lot of people in qualitative research, a lot of people with chronic pain see their body as crumbling and fragile. Um, but in reality, like as scientists, we know that the body is incredibly resilient and to even 
be able to have persistent pain. The body is overprotective. It's working really, really hard and it's very resilient. Um, but if they're getting framed and saying, like if, if the health professionals they're seeing are saying, you need surgery, you are broken, you need this again, or that means this has failed and you need to try that again, like obesity or whatever it is, like the, fail, 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 fail. All the language is you are fragile, you are broken, you cannot do it. Suddenly, like their locus of control is so far away. Like they don't have any self-efficacy left. No, everyone is telling them they can't do this. Um, and so to turn that around, it takes a... Uh, like it's not just one health professional. You need a psychologist. You need the pain specialist or whoever whoever's involved in the equivalent disciplines. Um, but yeah, so in terms of physical activity, I would say we need to be engaging with people who are experts at behavior change. And so whoever that is, and that there's a lot of different health professions that can do that. But I would say we can learn a lot from psychology because um, they're already doing that with lots of other um, like psychological conditions. And I would say that things like physical activity have a large um, psychological kind of role. Like how do you maintain behaviors and how do you change behaviors and how do you kind of set habits and routines and what's the family's routine and what do the family values align with and all those different questions can be unpacked um, early rather than waiting for problems to occur and then saying oh it's because you didn't do your your three times ten exercises um it's it's nothing to do with any of that it's they've set up a system for it to fail so why are you trying to to prescribe and like <laughs> they spend 29 minutes of a 30 minute appointment just doing something and then they say oh and here's the exercises good luck it's like that's not gonna help <laughs> like they've yeah. got no chance um yeah and i i think we need to be like really able to critically self-reflect and that's very hard and you have to be willing to be wrong and and yeah that's a challenge so 